Hi, I'm Alexi, and I'm here to talk to you about Dr. Async, a tool for identifying and visualizing anti-patterns in asynchronous JavaScript. This is joint work with Mike Shaw, Mark Aldrich, and Frank Tip. So before laying into asynchronous JavaScript anti-patterns, I really ought to introduce asynchronous JavaScript patterns. So this talk is going to begin with a kind of a long intro to some JavaScript language features that will be relevant throughout. Um, but first, um, if you're unfamiliar with the language, JavaScript is actually very popular. So at least according to the state of the Octoverse, so this GitHub um, you know, info dump that they put out every year. Um, it's the most popular language in GitHub repos, and it has been for a long time. And a large part of this popularity is owed to its you know, use as a server, as a client side uh, scripting language. But also lately, it's sort of emerging as a server side language as well due to performant runtimes like Node.js and the NPM package ecosystem, which makes it really easy to develop performant applications. So JavaScript isn't going anywhere, um, for better or worse. Uh, so there'll be a lot of JavaScript code in this talk. Um, so I'm just going to kind of introduce a simple JavaScript program line by line to give you a feel for it. So this is going to be a function which logs the contents of the directory to console. So first, we import a file system utility called fs. We then define a function called log all file names that takes in a path. We call fs.readDirSync, the synchronous utility for reading a directory on that path. And then for each file returned by that read, we'll just log it to console. So pretty straightforward. But there's already a few interesting things to mention here. One. JavaScript actually just has a single user thread. So it doesn't have multi-threading at that level. And so you know, this call to read or sync is actually going to block execution, which is not ideal. Um, you know, thankfully, uh, there are many ways around this. And the oldest uh, way, this has been around forever, is using callbacks. So the asynchronous version of reader is called fs.reader. And the second argument it takes in addition to its path is a callback. That callback has two parameters, error and files. And what will happen is essentially it will be this callback will be called once the contents of the directory have been read, which you know will be made available in files if it was successful, or the callback will be called with error, some error value, um, if it was unsuccessful. And then you know the code proceeds as normal. So this is the same file stuff for each that we had before. So a couple more things to mention. Um, even though it has a single user thread, JavaScript has an event loop, which lets it you know, process multiple things kind of at the same time, even though they're synchronous, they're not like asynchronous, but there are multiple events going on. Um, so this callback does actually get executed asynchronously. You know, it'll be called when the directory is ready. Um, and many JavaScript runtimes support multiple OS threads, like Node.js. So the read does indeed happen you know, in the background, which is great. But there is a better way. Um, at least there has been since 2015. So in ECMAScript 6, ECMAScript is just the JavaScript language standard, um, they introduced promises, which you may be familiar with from other languages. So essentially, a promise is just a promise of some asynchronous computation being completed at some future time. We can create a promise in JavaScript using the promise constructor. The promise constructor takes one argument called the executor function, which itself has two parameters, resolve and reject. Now, the general idea of a promise is that you know, in the body of this executor, if we want the promise to succeed, we will call resolve with the value that it su should succeed with. For example, if we had a promise version of reader, inside we would call resolve with the files if the reader is successful. Otherwise, we would call reject with a value that the promise should fail with. And those will be passed along to any reactions that are registered on the promise. Reactions are registered on promises using that. So in this little code snippet, what we're doing is we're registering a reaction on P so that if P is resolved, whatever it is resolved with, we're going to log it to console. So in this example, if P was resolved, this log would print fulfilled with value success. 
we can register a catch reaction, or like a, you can basically catch errors that occur in the promise, um, which are called in a similar way, where the reject value is passed along. So this looks a little bit better than callbacks. Um, and just to kind of put this at a little bit of higher level and inject some terminology here, promises are created using the promise constructor and they start in the pending state. We call resolve or reject in the body of the executor passed to the constructor, which then transitions the promise into a settled state, at which point we can register reactions with then and do error handling with catch. But an important piece of terminology I wanna emphasize here is that for the purpose of this talk, we'll define a promise lifetime to be the time between its creation and its settlement. Okay, so back to the logging file names example. Um, to write this using promises, uh, FS actually has a promise library inside of it. Um, so promise versions of all the functions. Um, so here we're calling fs.promises.reader, which returns a promise that the directory will be read. And then we register two reactions. Well, we register a reaction where the files are printed, you know, if the promise is successful, and we do error handling with catch. So same vibe as last slide. So that's nice, but we can do more. And the people at ECMAScript thought so too. And in 2017, um, ECMAScript 8 introduced async and await. So this is, this is the last language feature I'll introduce in this talk. So uh, we're at the end game here. Um, basically, async and await is syntactic sugar for promises. There's two main things that are added um, with this language feature. First, we can specify functions to be async which you know, indicates that they're going to be asynchronous. Uh, one key thing that this does is it causes the function to return a promise, you know, wrapping whatever it normally would return. So if you had some function that returned like two and you made it an async function, it would return a promise that was sort of wrapping that, that resolved with two. Inside of the body of async functions and only inside the body of async functions, can you write await expressions? And what await expressions do essentially is unwrap promises and bring out the value that they resolved with. So here we're awaiting a call to fs.promises.reader, which, if you recall, fs.promises.reader returns a promise, which has, you know, wrapping all the files in the directory. Await will take the promise away, and then the files will be made available. We can set that to files and then iterate through them. And this looks an awful lot like synchronous code, even though it is asynchronous. So that was a lot. Um, and if you think so, you're not alone. Just to kind of put this into context, um, JavaScript has been around since 1996. And uh, ECMAScript 6 introduced promises in 2015, and ECMAScript 8 introduced async and await in 2017. So that's 19 years of people using just callbacks to do their asynchronous programming, and five years of people doing callbacks and promises together and async and await also mixed with all that. That's really a lot to really wrap your mind around and not a lot of time to fully understand it. So our thought is um, promises are confusing. Async and await is kind of confusing and many programmers agree. You know, we looked on Stack Overflow, we looked at blog posts and there's sort of this prevailing theme that these things are kind of hard to, hard, can be hard to program with. So that's kind of the space we're operating on this talk. We want to try to find anti-patterns in people using and misusing promises in async await. So our first step toward going uh, toward finding that is to develop a tool to actually visualize promises in programs. And we the idea is to run this tool on many programs to try to get a sense for how people are using promises. So we achieve this by first building a dynamic profiling tool using the async hooks API which is an API made available by Node.js that gives you callbacks for promise creation, settlement, you know, what something was rejected with, gives you links between promises, all sorts of really juicy information that we can use to establish promise lifetimes. And then we took the results of this dynamic analysis and visualized them in this handy visualization that I have a screenshot of here. Each bar in the stacked bar chart represents a promise. Um, so the, you know, its leftmost point is when it was uh, first created, its rightmost point is when it was settled, 
And you know, one of the many useful features of the viz is you can hover over a promise and it will show you all of the other promises created at the same location that the selected promise was created at, you know, which can give you a good idea of like what code points are causing a lot of promises. And then what we did is we ran this on a bunch of code and we tried to find anti-patterns in how people were programming. And I'm gonna go through a couple of them now. So the first example of an anti-pattern is from the OpenAPI TypeScript CodeGen repository. So this is an async function called readspec that takes in some input. And then depending on what that input starts with, it will issue a call to another function. You know, that deals with the request depending on the, what the input looks like. Being an async function, we're probably gonna await it or do something promise related with it because as you'll recall, async functions always return promises. But that's weird, right? Because, okay, what are we doing in the return of this function? We're awaiting a call to something. So we're gonna unwrap the promise that was returned for example, by read spec from HTTPS. And then we're gonna wrap it again in a promise and then return it because read spec must return a promise. That seems inefficient. And you know, if you wanna unpack this call at the bottom of the slide here, really we're basically awaiting a wait to read spec from HTTPS, which is inefficient. Another example, um, this one a little bit more involved is from App Center CLI, which is a Microsoft um, repository. So they wrote a utility to recursively copy um, some directory to some other directory. So they define this function CP, an async function that determines if it's copying a directory. If so, it calls cpdir. Otherwise, it calls fs.promises.copy file. cpdir is itself a function that first does a read dir on the directory. And then for each entry returned by that, it will you know, determine exactly the path it should copy, but then await a call to CP. But that's kind of strange and a little bit inefficient because, okay, even though CP is asynchronous, each iteration of this loop is waiting for the call to CP to resolve before continuing. So you know, if there's 10 files, it'll read one file, it'll wait for a file to be copied. Okay, then it will wait for the next thing to be copied and then wait for the next thing and so on, which is not really what you would wanna do. Instead, you would wanna do all of these things at once, issue multiple copies at once, and then wait for them all to finish. This inefficiency is actually manifest in our visualization. You'll see in this viz, there are multiple, um, so here we ran CPDR on 10 files. There are multiple like sort of boxes of non-overlapping promises corresponding to each iteration of the loop which is indicative of a lack of concurrency. Really, you would wanna see many of them stacked together rather than have them be kind of disjoint like this. So abstracting a little bit, you know, we did this, we looked at a lot of code and we came up with eight anti-patterns. I don't wanna dig into all of them because we don't really have time for that. And in fact, I don't really wanna talk about them this way. The point that I wanna make on this slide is first of all, let's focus on the async function with the weighted return anti-pattern that we talked about. That was the first example that I gave. For each of these anti-patterns, we actually wrote a CodeQL query. So CodeQL is a really fun um, static analysis language that lets you uh, express static analyses as queries over ASTs or data flow graphs or control flow graphs, in this case, ASTs. So basically what this is saying is the async function with the weighted return anti-pattern matches functions that are themselves async and have a returned expression that is an instance of an await, await, an await expression, excuse me, tongue twister. You'll note that this actually matches the read spec function that we had earlier. Read spec, it async, and it do have return await of some stuff. So at this point, you might ask, okay, Alexi, you came up, y'all came up with eight anti-patterns. Do they even happen that much? And what can you do about them? And we asked ourselves the same question. So the first thing we were interested in doing um, was trying to determine how prevalent these anti-patterns actually are. So to do this, 
we conducted a study over 20 JavaScript packages, like of varying levels of popularity. Um, and we ran these code QL queries that we developed for these anti-patterns over each of them. And what we found was that there were very many instances of these anti-patterns strewn about these applications. So, you know, people are really misusing promises and in like committed, committed code and polished code. So this is like, there's really an opportunity to, to do better here. Okay, but what does doing better look like? How do you fix these anti-patterns? So to start, we conducted a case study in which we manually refactored 10 instances of each anti-pattern. And these were instances that we had confirmed did generate a promise at runtime using our profiling tool in Viz Combo. So this was because when we made the fix, we wanted to make sure that it preserved uh, the functionality of the application. All right, so we refactored 80 instances of our anti-patterns. And overall, we found that 65 of them, as outsiders to the project, we could manually refactor. That's really promising. I think that's very exciting. And I'm gonna give you some examples over the next two slides, positive and a negative. Now, the thing is, while these anti-patterns are simple enough, you know, the ones I showed you aren't altogether too complex, generating automated refactorings for them is not quite that easy. You know, there is complex control flow happening. Um, and, you know, there wasn't really a prevailing pattern of refactoring that we could apply, if that makes sense. But this is a very exciting area of future work. Um, I think it'd be really cool to see how many of these you could generate automatic refactorings for. But anyway, so we did this manually. So here are some examples. The first, I'll give an example of repairing the await in loop anti-pattern over the cpdir function I had before. So you'll recall that cpdir read a directory and then for each of those files awaited a call to cp. We can do better. And the way that we did that anyway in this manual refactoring is instead of looping over them using the for loop, we mapped over all of the files in the directory. And instead of awaiting the call to CP, we just collected all the promises created by CP. So we basically put them all in an array. That's what the files.map does. It basically makes an array of promises of that CP. And then we await a call to promise.all over that array. Promise.all is a promise utility in JavaScript that is resolved when the array of promises are all resolved. So this is kind of a way to issue multiple requests and then wait for them all to finish. This is actually manifest in the visualization. So on the left, um, the old CPDIR, you have this, uh, you know, these disjoint boxes of promises. And on the right, the refactored version, there are many more promises that are sort of like vertically stacked. There's a lot more concurrency because there are more stacked promises, more promises overlap in their lifetimes. Now, I'm gonna end with an example of, a, of our inability to repair an instance of the anti-pattern. Um, so this is a function called get namespace that basically just in a try catch calls other function, get namespace from manifest JSON and awaits that. So this is an example of having an await in an async function which is not great. However, we cannot refactor this because what the await does is it forces the promise to resolve now so that the try catch can handle the error. If we didn't have the await, the caller would have to deal with the error. And we didn't really feel comfortable making that refactoring, although it technically could be possible. So yeah. Um, this has been Dr. Async, a tool for identifying and visualizing anti-patterns in asynchronous JavaScript. Um, we hopefully by this, you know, this point, you sort of believe us that promises are easy to misuse and many programmers are often misusing them. We developed simple static analyses, which detect thousands of instances in 20 popular JavaScript repositories. And we developed a Viz tool and a dynamic profiler that sort of corroborates this. So it's sort of this whole package of information that can really help programmers um, fix these anti-patterns. And we did find that many of them could be fixed. And in many cases, and like these fixes all eliminate redundant promises and in some cases improve performance. So 
past me was delighted to present this talk to you. And uh, future me will be delighted to take your questions, I'm sure. Uh, thanks for your time. <laughs>